Morning Show. We're coming to you this morning on Channel 9 on WJOPLP Newburyport at FM 96.3 and on Newburyport Community Media's YouTube channel at ncmhub.org. I'm your host, Mary Jacobson, and I'm just delighted to welcome today's guest. Neil Thompson is here. He's the author of this fascinating book, The First Kennedys, The Humble Roots of an American Dynasty. Neil is a journalist and he's the author of five highly acclaimed books, including A Curious Man, Driving with the Devil, The Hip Flip Boys. He's a former reporter and he's written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, Esquire, Vanity Fair, and the Wall Street Journal. Neil, first of all, welcome to The Morning Show and thank you so much for taking time to do this interview. Oh, Mary, thank you for making the time. I'm happy to be here. Looking forward I to it. I really appreciate it. Well, Neil, let's start here. You know, before the Kennedys were the legendary dynasty that we remember them personifying with wealth, glamour, politics, power, Camelot, and the tragic loss of Camelot. Before the dynasty, there was, as you describe it in your book, the largely forgotten truth that it started pretty much with nothing. Just a poor, hardworking, widowed grocer named Bridget and her four fatherless children in an East Boston tenement. The endurance and savvy of that lost matriarch, as you call her, really is the heart and soul of the first Kennedys. And gosh, Neil, it only makes the ultimate dynasty that more extraordinary. You begin your book with a story of how you personally became engaged with this missing chapter of the Kennedy saga. And I hope that we might start this conversation with you telling us a story of what you what drew you to want to fill in the missing pieces of that Kennedy saga. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks again for doing this. Um, you know, I, I guess my um, my intro to this story or this piece of the Kennedy saga started way back in 1999 when John F. Kennedy Jr., uh, you know, his plane disappeared off the coast of yeah. Martha's Vineyard and he perished, as did his wife and his sister-in-law. At the, at the time, I was working for the Baltimore Sun newspaper and they sent me up to Hyannisport to cover that story. Um, so I was part of that mob scene of reporters hanging out outside the Kennedy compound, that famous Kennedy compound yeah. on the water there. And, and I, I was struck by just still how passionately we as a country feel toward, felt toward the Kennedys at that time. I describe, and this is in the opening pages of the book, I describe being at a bar, <laughs> sipping on a Jameson's at, when we got word of, of uh, them finding the plane and finding the bodies and the bartender, uh, the barmaid started crying and she said she felt like she lost a family member. And I realized that, you know, we, th we think of the Kennedys as our royal family um, and, and we have this just deep attachment to them, what they represented at one point in time in the 1960s. And then, you know, uh, we became attached to the hardships that they, they faced over time. So I left that, 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 uh, that, that scene thinking a lot about the Kennedys and where it all began. So that was the question that stuck in my mind after that episode was, where did this really start, our passion for this family? Uh, as I was driving south toward Baltimore, I ended up going through New Jersey, which is where I was born and raised, and realized that I was passing at that time within just a couple miles of the cemetery where my Irish immigrant grandparents were buried. Their names were Bridget and Patrick, same as the the, the characters in this book. The, the yeah. first Kennedys are, are Bridget and Patrick Kennedy. Um, so it took many fits and starts for me to figure out really how to approach this story. And what really brought it into focus was, um, this is jumping forward many years now, 2016 election um, and, and hearing um, us have these conversations about immigration and immigrants in this country that were very reminiscent of the, 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 the dialogue we were having in this country back yeah. in the 1800s. And we have across time, right, when it comes to any yeah. immigrant group. So what I decided was, let's, let me really try and focus on the immigrant aspect of the Kennedy story. You know, what was life like coming for them to come to a country that at that time didn't, didn't want them here, didn't want Irish Catholics here? Yeah. Well, that brings us to um, a primary theme of your book, which is the immigrant experience that I wanted to talk to you about, Neil, because you express it so well in the book. Because of course, the history of the Kennedys in this country begins with the story of massive waves, um, desperately impoverished Irish immigrants coming to this country from the 1840s on, looking as of course immigrants do for a better life for themselves and hopefully an even better life for their children. 
what I found remarkable and important uh, about the stories you tell is how you not only make clear that there's a story in American history of possibility and progress, but there's a parallel and timeless and equally very American story of bigotry, of hatred and violence, as you were just saying, directed against each new wave of immigrants as they alive, as they arrive in this country. It, it's been said that today's immigrants are tomorrow's nativists. Yeah. Um, and uh, so please uh, fill us in on the situ. First, the si first, let's start with the situation in Ireland that the immigrants were um, desperate to flee from and the conditions of their transport to this country. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks for picking up on that because it's such an important theme of the book and an important one for me to have explored because I, I think it says a lot about who we are as a country, both good and bad. Um, so the situation in Ireland was the, the, the Great Potato Famine in the mid-1840s devastated that country. I mean, it was already a deeply impoverished, uh, uh, you, you know, almost pagan type of uh, 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 lifestyle for poor farmers living on these small farms. Um, the Irish didn't own their own land. You know, it was, it was the, the entire island was colonized by England. Um, and so they just scratched out a living for themselves. And many of them subsisted largely on potatoes because their more valuable crops were sold to pay the rent to the absentee English landlords who owned their property. So when the potato famine hit, which was this devastating crop failure that occurred 1845 and the next two years after that, um, they, they lost their primary source of, of nutrition and sustenance. Yeah. So, um, you know, just to round things off in a terrible way, a million people or more starved to death or died of uh, associated diseases. Uh, and then another one to two million escaped. Uh, realize this is not sustainable. The, that country lost, you know, nearly half of its population from that point in the mid 1840s up until the, you know, 1850s and onward. Um, and so this is this is uh, the situation that that Bridget Murphy Kennedy faced. She was uh, li living in County Wexford, small farm that her parents ran. Um, and she was the one who either decided on her own, which is how I like to think of it, and or the family decided Bridget should be the one to go to America. Like, let's send one of our family members out of here uh, toward a hopefully better life, you know, establish a bulkhead of sorts in in uh, uh, in the new land. And then she would send for other family members to come later. So Bridget left Ireland alone. Um, she was in her mid twenties um, and she was part of this wave of uh, uh, refugees really escaping from Ireland. But what I loved learning about was that she was part of um, a wave of female Irish immigrants okay. leaving at that time. More Irish women left than Irish men during this period of time. Uh, and I think it says a lot about her, her personality and her tenacity that she was willing to take this risk and cross uh, you know, to, to a new land on a dangerous, you know, coffin ships as they were known. Yeah. Um, many people died on those dangerous crossings. Ships were sunk at sea. People got de de uh, horribly sick during these crossings that could take anywhere from four weeks to 10 weeks, depending on weather and other conditions. So it was a very risky thing to do. You just didn't, people just didn't cross the ocean at that time. Yeah. Uh, only out of desperation did they do so. She finally makes it to America and finds, hmm, it's not so it's not so easy going here either. Uh, so she started out, um, you know, in, instantly facing many of the 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 uh, the conditions, the hatred and the discrimination that many subsequent and prior generations of immigrants faced across time. But um, yeah. you know, it was not an easy time. Yeah, no, it 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 took tremendous grit and gumption. Um, to make that voyage and to make the decision to come, especially on her own. And one of the things that I appreciated about your book was how you give vivid descriptions of just how unimaginably poor the people in Ireland were, in Ireland were how desperate their situation was that would drive them to make um, this really challenging uh, trip across the ocean. I, I just think it's important for us to understand what immigrants are fleeing and what they've been putting up with and how um, intense their motivation is that they are able to uh, make that leap. You know, my, my, 
I know your your ancestors came from Ireland. Uh, so did uh, both my grandparents on my mother's side. And I never had the chance to meet my grandmother, but my mother always used to tell me that, and she came over later, not in the 1840s, more the 1880s, but the, the, the voyage must still have been pretty difficult because my mother said that my grandmother always said she would only go back to Ireland when they built a bridge. <laughs> In other words, no more, no boats. The memories, yeah. were, I guess that traumatic, understandably so. Well, you started talking about, you know, how things weren't that great when they got to this country because they encountered a lot of bigotry. And that's an important story that you tell too, Neil. And I hope that you might say a little bit more about um, what shape did the bigotry take that the Irish met when they, um, when they arrived in Boston? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to discuss that. And I guess I'll, I'll start by saying I was surprised to learn how deep the hatred was toward these uh, Irish Catholic immigrants at that time. You know, I, I went into this project having a general sense of how as a nation over time we have treated various groups of immigrants. Um, and I knew in general terms that the Irish had it rough. Um, but was really uh, shocked as I drilled deeper to learn um, what they were truly up against. You know, I think when when America first learned about the Irish potato famine, there was initially a little bit of commiseration and funds were sent across to help them. Um, and then as soon as they started arriving here, sick and poor and uh, and just, you know, just in rags in many cases. Um, um, many Americans, especially in cities like Boston, were like, the re reaction was, wait a second, we, we felt bad for you, but we didn't want you to all come here, especially not all at once. So the country was kind of overwhelmed by these, these uh, waves of boatloads of immigrants coming uh, uh, during that period of time. And it triggered this I sort of describe uh, American nativism, and it's been described similarly elsewhere. Um, well, my wife has a, word, a term for it. It's like herpes. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> it, it flares up, it goes into remission, it flares <laughs> up yeah. again. Yeah. And this period of time when the Irish arrived, it, it, it triggered this full-on um, outbreak of native, yeah. nativism that had been on kind of a slow boil and uh, maybe, maybe not so obvious at, 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 at all times, but, um, you know, there were, there were, there were voices, uh, preachers and politicians and, and, and authors and, and thinkers, you, you know, people who otherwise were pr praised for the good works that they did at that time, who came out and said, let's send them back. Y you know, uh, we heard this, the same language used at that time that we, heard in recent years um but but it it, it was it was mainly fear of their religion that that triggered this this nativism and i describe in the book how you see this uh side by side you know the the income of the irish and the rise of nativist political parties and newspapers you know i i explored the the know nothing party um, uh, you know, trying to enact laws to keep Irish immigrants oppressed, to prevent them from voting, to prevent them from becoming uh, citizens, to prevent them from owning businesses, to control what they learned in the schools. Um, and, and, you know, you had these screeds at that time shrieking that they were coming to take over our country, that, the, you know, the papists, as they were known, were coming to bring their freaky religion and, and overthrow America. I mean, there was just <clears throat> conspiracy theorists and I described boys clubs, these social groups that got together and, you know, had these sort of secret meetings talking about how to, to uh, either keep them down or send them back. You know, yeah. the same kind of things we hear across time. Yeah, it, it was, uh, um, to use your helpful metaphor, a full-on herpes flare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No whole card. <laughs> nope. and, and that, I think, is an important, it's important, too, because um, it, it's just helpful to understand uh, each immigrant group that's come to this country has had to put up with that. Yeah. And so that's, an, so it helps us to appreciate the tenacity and the accomplishments um, and the endurance of what each immigrant group has had to overcome to be uh, become um, to acquire their rights as citizens, voting, uh, economic equality. It's just been a struggle, and I, I think it's so important that we appreciate what they've been through. Oh, I couldn't agree arrival. more. 
you know, and, and, and the economic challenges that they face just for starters, you know, starting out at the bottom rung of the economic ladder, taking on the most difficult and dangerous jobs on top of which you have these mobs of people, you know, surrounding your church and chanting that you should go back home. And, um, you know, at just at, at every turn, they were just confronted by hardship, disease that stalked the slums where many of them were forced to live. Um, I describe in the book, Bridget losing her first son, John F. Kennedy. Um, and another example of the discrimination they faced was when her son died, she couldn't bury him in Boston because- Oh, yeah, that was heartbreaking. <laughs> right? I mean, you, there were laws to prevent Irish Catholic, well, Catholics from yeah. burying bodies inside city limits. So, so she had to travel west to Cambridge to a, uh, a cemetery that will, would allow uh, a, a, a Catholic uh, person to be buried there. It was remarkable. Yeah. There's just such um, pathos to the, the 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 caravan out to Cambridge that you describe in the book. I mean, no one should have to go through that, and yet yeah. they did because of the strength of the prejudice against Catholics. Um, so, well, Neil, tell us some more about Bridget Murphy Kennedy. Um, you know, you've mentioned that she, clearly she had guts, <laughs> courage to come, yeah. and it wasn't easy. And yet, and and she lost her husband. Um, and um, how did she manage to succeed in spite of the bias she encountered? Because she didn't encounter just anti-Irish and anti-Catholic Irish, but gender bias as well. Yeah. Um, so tell us about um, what you came to understand and appreciate about how she managed to become the successful businesswoman that she did. Yeah, I find her to be such a remarkable character, Mary. Like, I think Bridget just... I, I'm surprised that she hasn't been written about more and that she hasn't been upheld as the true matriarch of this family because so much of what they subsequent generations of Kennedys were able to achieve, it all traces back to her ability to keep her family intact and to manage to achieve some level of success during a time when it, it all so easily could have fallen apart. You yeah. Know? So she comes to America, faces the discrimination that we just talked about, loses her first son. Uh, as you mentioned, she loses her husband, Patrick, who died 10 years after they came to America. Um, she buries him also in Cambridge Cemetery, west of downtown uh, Boston um, in 1858, and at the time holding her infant son, PJ, in her arms. And she's got three terrified daughters by her side. You know, she's left widowed and alone with four kids in, in the slums of East Boston, and at the time working as a maid. Um, so clearly not making very money, very much money at the time, and um, just sort of barely keeping it together. But it's almost a, as if from that point when her husband died moving forward, she snapped to it and and uh, whatever sort of grit and ambition and, and tenacity that was deep inside of her came out to the fore. And she's step by step sort of moved her way up uh, in, in, into this level of sort of middle class uh, achievement. She worked as a hairdresser first at a, um, uh, the, the well known uh, department store, Jordan Marsh in downtown yeah. Boston. Um, she uh, later somehow found the funding and support uh, to open her own little grocery shop in East Boston. Um, in time, she was able to buy the building where the grocery shop existed. Uh, she lived there. She rented out other apartments to incoming Irish immigrants, two of whom became her sons-in-law. So she and her business and her, her apartment complex really became this hub around which her whole family and, and uh, other Irish immigrants kind of circulated. So in, in you know less than 20 years, she went from being uh, nothing uh, at, at risk of losing her her kids um, because so many poor Irish kids, especially fatherless kids, were sent to orphanages. Or, um, but she she became a, an entrepreneur, a yeah. successful business owner, um, and and a respected figure in the community. Um, and, and I find that ascent to be so so inspiring and impressive. Uh, especially given everything that she was up against. You men mentioned the, the gender bias, the misogyny yeah. that she was up against. You know, this was old school Brahmin Boston, right? Yeah. Um, you know, home of some founding fathers and, and home of these old school families like the Adamses and 
um, and others, and they they didn't want Irish running the show. They didn't want women running the show. They wanted to keep things stuffy and Puritan and pr Protestant and old school the way it had been for many decades. So to, to see upstart Irish widowed immigrant women like like Bridget sort of take control of her her life and her story. Um, I, I think it's remarkable, um, and I think she deserves way more credit than she gets for for having achieved that, and and in turn, uh, giving her son PJ the life that he had, which allowed him to become a politician and an even more successful business person in in his own right. Way before we get to the Joe Kennedys and his his yeah. his clan. Yeah, tremendous. Um, to use a phrase, my mother always would use tremendous backbone there. Yeah. Um, a tremendous um, savvy and also a good heart because she was also, you know, very generous um, to family um, and friends. And, and, and clearly, uh, you know, she, she did get that dynasty started. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad that you, happened without her. <laughs> you've clarified that for time and history. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you mentioned her son, PJ, and, and, you know, I, I think with PJ, people have heard of PJ Kennedy because he was father of Joe Kennedy. And so when we get to PJ, we get to part of the Kennedy history that more of us are familiar with, a successful right. businessman and politician, a backroom deal maker extraordinaire, and, and a well-liked, also generous human being. And I mentioned he's father of Joe Kennedy, who then, of course, married Rose Kennedy, the daughter of Honey Fitz Fitzgerald. Um, and that's what most of us think of as the dynasty's mm -hmm. beginning, Joe and Rose. Um, so, Neil, though, um, as you thought about this, what are what have we been missing um, about the Kennedys, what they mean to us, what their aspirations were, what their significance is in American history and culture when we haven't known about Bridget's contribution? Yeah, you, you're absolutely right, Mary. And I think that's what drove my passion for this story. And I really went out of my way to tell the backstory, the way it hasn't fully been told before, I hope, because you're right. So much of what we know about the Kennedys, we think we, we it's almost as if we think it all started with Joe, like, and, and he played off that too. I think Joe, yeah. you know, played off the story of himself as this up from the bootstraps, poor kid, um, you know, lifting that family onto his shoulders and becoming an instant success and all these things. And it's just not fully true. He 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 was born to wealth and privilege, uh, and, and that wealth and privilege was only because of his father and before that his grandmother. Um, so I really wanted to not discount entirely Joe Kennedy and what he was able to achieve. He's clearly an important historical figure. I don't think he was a very nice person, um, and, and so I wanted to show not only where the Kennedys really truly came from, but to show some of the traits and characteristics that we think of as being Kennedy-esque, yeah. um, you, you know, concern for the poor, for those who have less than, compassion for others, um, and, a, and a, a strong sense of the value of the immigrant. I mean, you know, JFK writes that book, A Nation of Immigrants, which um, is, uh, you know, in, in praise of the value that people from other countries bring to this country. All of those sensibilities, I think, skipped Joe. It's picked up in John and Bobby and their sisters and others. You see Eunice helping create the Special Olympics. You know, there are examples of that family being giving back yeah. across time. Yeah. And I think all of that really begins with, as we discussed, Bridget being this community nexus and, and helping others who are coming and experiencing the same hardships that she faced. And then and then PJ as a politician was very much focused on uh, his constituents, his neighbors, helping those who needed a hand. He was known for being maybe too generous with those to whom he loaned or gave money or helped them find a job. I was able to access P.J. Kennedy's uh, papers at the JFK Library, and many of those papers are letters from P.J. to others trying to help someone, <clears throat> yeah. you know, trying to help someone find a place to live or a job or recommending someone for, for college. He was very much focused on, on giving back and helping, and I think that says a lot about that family, but it, but it's, it also traces those sensibilities back to Bridget and P.J. Yeah. Yeah, the legacy 
all those traits you just mentioned, those are there very clearly when you read your book, they're there in Bridget too. And so she's just the, the, the source. Yeah, right. <laughs> At least the source we can know anything about. Yeah. Um, so, we, you know, Neil, I grew up in an era when the Kennedys were just an enchantment. They were the ultimate in class, glossy, inspirational figures. Um, you know, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, which seems like an antique sentiment <laughs> sometimes <laughs> today. But they represented hope. Um, and I remember, as I think everyone of, who was alive did. I remember where I was the day that JFK was shot and how heartbroken I felt along with everybody else. But I wondered as I read your book, if the Kennedys are still the Kennedys. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, we're famous today for very short attention spans and younger generations, they never knew JFK or RFK or even Jackie Onassis. Um, so, uh, and, and to me, it, it sometimes feels as though the younger generations of Kennedys may not have the same kind of charisma or certainly not the same kind of presence in, in American culture and life. So I'm curious to find out your thoughts about whether the Kennedy dynasty has died off or at least become diminished. Because you've been on a book tour lately with your book about the first mm -hmm. Kennedys. And I'm curious to find out what your sense of that based on what you hear from people who've been coming to your book reading, what ages are they are, what kind of views do they have of the Kennedys today? Yeah, I, 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 I've thought a lot about that, that question about the, the legacy and where it stands now, where it's headed. Are the Kennedys the same Kennedys that we think of when we think capital K Kennedys? Um, but I think you're probably right. I think it is, I don't know if dying out is the right term for it, but it's definitely diminished. And, and clearly the, 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 the concept of Camelot, I, I think is no more, right? Uh, in fact, just recently we, uh, with the loss in the primaries of Joe Kennedy the yeah. third, um, we now do not have a Kennedy in Congress for the first time in many years, yeah. you know, starting with JFK's election in 1946, I believe, um, you know, there was, there had been a Kennedy in Congress or in the White House for, you know, most of my lifetime, for sure, and, and going even before that. So now that we don't have a Kennedy in, 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 in Congress, um, not that it won't happen, it does feel like, you know, it's just sort of maybe petered out, and maybe that's just how these things go. I do think other members of the family have found ways to serve in their own way, yeah. you know, philanthropic efforts and uh, sort of behind the scenes efforts, community efforts. Um, but, you know, there, and there are complications like, um, you know, uh, uh, is it Robert Kennedy who, you know, has been a very vocal anti-vaxxer? Um, yeah. And, and I think that complicates how people view the Kennedys today. Yeah. Um, I also think we're uh, in, a, in a period of time where looking back on this family of wealth and privilege, even though they did give back, um, you know, we were now more aware of so, some of the, the, the faults and flaws and failures yes. of, of JFK and others. Um, so I think it does make sense that maybe the country has kind of moved on. But to your question about people I ran into on my book tour, I think there's still uh, a deep sense of um uh you know appreciation nostalgia maybe more than anything um and in some cases love for that family and what they represented i think we do as a country want to have dynasties people that we uh, get to know across time who are our leaders you know we're a democracy but we came from you know our colonizer England, where they still revere the, you know, the royal family. And I think we always thought of the Kennedys as our royal family. Yeah. And as it's sort of, as you said, diminished, um, uh, I, I think there's a little bit of sadness in that. You know, yeah. there had been great hope for JFK Jr. He dies. I yeah. mean, there's so much tragedy in that family, which is, I think, another thing that draws us to them and their, and their story and their history. Um, and I guess it's my hope that this piece of that family history going back further in a way other books haven't maybe will give us a fresh perspective on what uh, uh they they mean to america because they are truly representative of the immigrant success story the uh you yeah. know the, achieving the american dream from 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 nothing um and uh i, I would love to see 
Bridget be remembered for, you know, the role she played in, in, in giving us that family, that royal yeah. family that we think of. Yeah, well put, Neil, an extraordinary success story in the face of extraordinary hardship and extraordinary loss and tragedy along the yeah. way. Um, but you know, the hook for me with the Kennedys is still wondering what would have happened to our country if JFK hadn't been killed or if RFK hadn't been killed. Those are yeah. things I occasionally, I mean, there's no way to answer those questions, but they're things that I sometimes speculate upon. Um, not in a very specific way, but just my sense is we might have been better off. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel the same way. And I think that's so, why we're still connected to the family. Yeah, There's that sadness uh, right. uh, over the loss of what might have been. Right. Yeah. Well, Neil, it's a wonderful book. Um, and uh, I thank you uh, for writing it because hmm. I learned so much from it. Um, and I thank you for taking time to visit the show today. I've really enjoyed talking to you. Uh, so thank you so much, Neil. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. And I, oh. I just have learned so much, not just about the Kennedys, but about certain aspects of American history as well. That does, and, you know, and this sort of circles back to your introductory story about what hooked you in with the 2016 election and the issue of immigrants and uh, fear mongering about immigrants and dehumanizing immigrants. And you just fill that, that uh, history in, in a very illuminating way in your book, which I really appreciated. So thank you, Neil. Oh, thank the book. Mary, thank you so much. I really enjoyed speaking with you. This was this was a treat. Totally my pleasure. All right, take you take care now. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>